Like most children growing up, I was obsessed with animals, in particular dolphins. I think it was their intelligence and empathy that really resonated with me and is what made them my favorite animal. So when my dad told me he was going to take me to Sentosa Island to see dolphins for the first time, I was extremely excited. I can't recall much from the day other than queuing as groups went up one by one to touch and take photographs with this pink dolphin. He is the one they took of me and my dad. But I do remember several years later as a teenager, watching a documentary called The Cove, quickly followed by another called Blackfish. After watching those documentaries, I felt immensely guilty for my contribution to that industry and made the decision to never again support a business that involves the captivity of whales or dolphins. But the impact of these documentaries goes far beyond just me. Blackfish in particular had an immense impact on SeaWorld and their operations. The changes brought about by this documentary became so significant it was dubbed the Blackfish Effect. Now as a media student, I wonder, how was Blackfish able to have the impact it had? And what role can documentary play in creating positive change? Although Blackfish was clearly able to influence the attitude and behaviors of myself and many others, it's likely this is only because the information and ideas it shared with us already aligned with our personal biases. In fact, a survey published by the ASPCA a year before Blackfish was released found that 71% of Americans supported undercover investigative efforts to expose farm animal abuse. Ideas and documentaries such as Bowling for Columbine, on the other hand, were not as widely accepted or acted upon. Despite being critically successful and sparking debate, the film had to battle against the prominent ideology of the right to bear arms in the United States. While no tangible changes to gun control or social movements are considered to be a direct result of the film, its director Michael Moore was able to raise awareness at a societal level. Perhaps without his controversial tactics, the level of discussion surrounding the documentary and gun control in general at that time would never have occurred. But what about when documentaries are able to resonate with us? When they're able to help us begin to overcome our personal biases? Clearly Blackfish demonstrates that public outrage can lead to change in the policies of governments or private organizations. But Frederick Wiseman shows us how documentaries are also able to change the minds of the public in order to support existing legislation. Wiseman's 1967 documentary, Titicut Follies, exposed the extreme mistreatment of patients at Bridgewater State Hospital for the criminally insane. The film's release resulted in a public outcry that led to improved treatment of inmates at the facility, such as hiring more nurses and clothing those who had previously been kept naked. Interestingly, however, President Kennedy had already proposed a reform act to end inhumane methods of treating the mentally ill three years earlier but this was largely unsuccessful due to a lack of community interest. Perhaps by addressing a taboo subject such as mental health, Wiseman aided the public in overcoming their biases towards the mentally ill, finally garnering support for reform acts such as Kennedy's and improving the conditions of Bridgewater's inmates. However, it's difficult to say whether Titicut Follies would have had the same impact if not for this existing reform act. And so both the film and legislation seem to have a mutually beneficial relationship, with neither being able to create change without the other. Despite the focus on social issues in his works, Wiseman himself does not view documentary as an agent of social change, suggesting they have no measurable social utility. As a prominent figure in direct cinema, his films lack the necessary assertions of clear actions and their benefits that are generally needed to motivate audiences. Filmmakers such as Michael Brown, on the other hand, seem to be well aware of the importance of using their films to educate and then facilitate action. 
His participatory documentary, Kachad Mule, depicts the lives of working equines in Nepal, and he has clear plans for how his film may be used to improve their working conditions. So we're going to hire a big screen and a projector and a loudspeaker system. We're going to do street screenings in the brick factories in Nepalganj and in Arket town in the mountains. Um, with tea and snacks and everything in the evening to make it a big community of event. But post screening and uh, pre screening and post screening, we're going to do some quantitative and qualitative assessment of changes in the, the mule owners and the mule handlers knowledge about their mules, their attitudes towards their mules, and then their behavior towards them. So knowledge and attitudes is fairly easy to assess in the short term, but um, using focus group discussions, Animal Nepal are going to facilitate the communities to develop action plans uh, based on their new knowledge and, and awareness of their, of their mules. These screenings embody Paolo Freire's theories of liberation theology and conscientization, which describe how oppressed groups are liberated through dialogue by taking a step back to view their lives objectively and in gaining liberation are also able to liberate their oppressor. During my research, I was also able to speak to Alex Arumpak, director of Aswang. The film exposes the toll of President Duterte's controversial war on drugs in the Philippines and the resulting surge of extrajudicial killings by the police currently taking place. The film has been made freely available in the Philippines and the filmmakers are working to organize community screenings where television or the internet may not be accessible. The hope is that the film might influence some voters before the upcoming 2022 elections. In my correspondence with Alex, she tells me, The lady who was telling me about the secret prison didn't know what the police was doing was illegal. She thought that was really how things were done. The woman Alex is referring to is featured in the documentary, sharing her experience of being kidnapped by the police and held for ransom. The fact that someone could think that this treatment is normal shows us how violence, abuse and brutality at the hands of the police has become so commonplace for some of Manila's most vulnerable communities. In my view, it epitomises the importance of screening films like this back to the communities they represent. Hopefully Aswang will allow those being abused by Duterte's government to take a step back from their lives, as Freire suggests, and see that this treatment is not normal and can no longer be tolerated. Of course, this knowledge alone cannot topple the structural injustices faced by Manila's impoverished communities but it is undoubtedly an important stepping stone in their liberation. So, what is the role of documentary filmmaking in creating societal change? Films such as Blackfish or Bowling for Columbine are aimed at mainstream audiences, hoping to influence larger parts of society on the issues that impact larger parts of society. Films such as Cushion Mule or Aswang, on the other hand, are aimed at more niche audiences in order to help them contemplate issues that they specifically are affected by, and in doing so, spark grassroots movements for social change. But regardless of these differences, they all aim to encourage conversation, debate and reflection. Yes, it is important not to overstate what a documentary can achieve, and the changes they create may not always be immediately tangible. But often the viewing of a documentary is what pushes us to embark on that vital quest for the revelation of the why.